We finished off the last video entering into the Great Depression. It wasn't just a depression for the US, it was a depression for the world. But I want to back up a little bit, because I forgot to mention a very important fact that's hugely important to the rest of US history in the 20th century. And that's what happened in 1917, actually during World War I. And that's the Bolshevik Revolution. The Russian Empire was overthrown by the Bolsheviks, and it became the Soviet Union. And it, which you probably know, was a communist state. And it became the United States' arch enemy over the rest of, well, not over the rest of, but af near the, I guess, the second half of the 20th century. So with that out of the way, I just want to make sure you know that Russia is now the Soviet Union. Let's fast forward back through the Great Depression. And probably the one point when we're doing this very high level overview that's of interest. And as you can see, even though the focus of this series of videos is on US interest, what's happening in the rest of the world is starting to become much more important because the US is starting to become this really serious global actor. And so in 1933, so this is right in the middle, right in the middle of this global depression, and Germany was especially hit hard, especially because of all of the damage done by World War I and the war reparations and all the rest. You have Hitler coming to power as Chancellor of Germany, and it's interesting to note that it was actually he came to power in a democratic process. Chancellor of Germany is analogous to Prime Minister of other countries, and so essentially he was ruling a coalition. His the Nazis, his party, did not have the majority, but they were able to control this coalition, although it was a very weak one. But what they were good at is intimidating and rigging elections and all of the rest. And so over the course of the rest of the 30s, essentially the Nazis con consolidated power until we get to 1939. And the rest of the world was, you know, they would kind of watch Hitler. He was consolidating power, turning it in. He came in democratically, but he was essentially consolidating power under himself, turning it into a dictatorship. He was militarizing Germany. People started to get concerned, but they all kind of wanted to, uh, they had the doctrine of appeasement. Hey, you know, let's just, let's just kind of, you know, not make him too angry and maybe he won't start anything too bad. But in 1939, Germany invades Poland. Invades Poland. And this is kind of viewed as the one event that the kind of uh, you know the straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak. And so it begins World War II. So this is the beginning of World War II. And initially, it's between I guess the if you think about the great powers that initially get involved, it is the British Empire and the Soviet Union. France is involved. It quickly gets overrun by the Nazis. And what happens is, is that the US, for, it wasn't like the situation with World War I where the US was trying to stay neutral. The US had recognized, especially FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he had recognized that Hitler that Hitler was an aggressor, that, that he was, um, I, I guess from, from FDR's point of view, definitely in the wrong here. So even from the beginning of World War II, the US did help support did help support the allies, support the allies. So it would uh, send arms and any other type of assistance. When Japan and Italy joined on the side of Germany, the US embargoed oil to Japan. The US was an exporter of oil to Japan. And you can imagine Japan did not produce a lot of its own oil. And oil is super important when you're trying to run a war machine. So that didn't make Japan too happy. So you fast forward to 1941. And you have Japan bombing Pearl Harbor. So until this point, US kind of played a, 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 a non-direct role. It definitely supported the allies. It did what it could economically and by providing military aid, but it did not actively participate in the fighting. But then December 7th, 1941, the Japanese bomb our, bombed the US, the US Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. And that's a whole interesting uh, debate because, uh, or discussion, because it was lucky for the US that most, a lot of the Pacific Fleet was not there. But it was obviously this uh, kind of, this thing that would, that convinced the US public that it was that World War II was worth joining. So in 1941, because of Pearl Harbor, the US enters the war, and it enters the war in both arenas, both in Europe and in the Pacific. And then you fast forward, it goes against the Italians in North Africa, and then you fast forward to 1944, it actually enters 
it actually enters into the fight in mainland Europe. This is the invasion of Normandy. This is D-Day, June 6, 1944. If you've ever seen Saving Private Ryan, it starts with this, and it's probably, you know, I've never been in a, on, I've never stormed a beach, but I can imagine that's probably the the most realistic reenactment of what it was like to storm the beach at Normandy. But you fast forward to 1945, and eventually. The, the especially between the Soviet and the US, or I should say all of the Allied forces, they are able to, uh, I guess, win the European front of World War II. And, and then you fast forward till the end of that year, Japan was still kind of fighting pretty ferociously. And so the US, and you know this is once again, I could make many videos of this, we can debate uh, the ethical implications of this, but the US it develops the atomic bomb ignites one over Hiroshima, and then a few days later, one over Nagasaki. And that essentially ends World War II. And so the outcome of World War II is you have two remaining superpowers. You have the Soviet Union, you have the Soviet Union, and you have the United States. And what happens after that is that you have the Cold War. These two huge powers, the Soviet Union is this is this communist country. It, it's obviously trying to uh, create this communist sphere of influence. A lot of Eastern Europe was falling under Soviet sway. The United States, not a communist country, a very capitalist country, uh, you can imagine. And this is something that gets confused a lot. The Soviet Union was communist, and it was totalitarian. It, Communism and democracy aren't necessarily things that go against each other, but the Soviet Union had had neither a capitalist system nor democracy. It was it was both communist and totalitarian. And when I when I say communist, I'm talking about no private wealth. The state really owned all resources. The United States, on the hand, other hand, was hugely capitalist, and you could imagine many people in the United States did not want any of this communism business uh, to kind of. Well, come come to us. So you have this major battle that never really erupts into direct conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States. It's always done through through proxies, through people who that the United States or the Soviet Union is acting on the behalf or who are acting on the behalf of the United States or Soviet Union, but you have the Cold War beginning. And it's called the Cold War because it wasn't a hot war. The United States and the Soviet Union never really fired bullets at each other. Instead they supported they supported other parties that would fire bullets at the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union would support other parties that would fire bullets at the United States. And for the United States, it was all about stopping communism. It was all about preventing uh, you know, this domino theory that if one country in a region would fall to communism, that other countries would. So the United States became a bit uh, uh, paranoid, or maybe it was justified either way. It, it was very concerned about the spread of communism. And the first time that this really gets tested, in 1950 is an interesting year. Because this is the first time, obviously the US had nuclear weapons as of 1945, but in 1950, the Soviet Union tested its first nuclear weapon. So now the Cold War is starting to get very serious. Both of these adversaries can now nuke each other if they wanted to. And also in 1950, you have Korea. And Korea, before World War II, so that's a very small depiction of Korea, it was a Japanese colony. But obviously, Japan had now lost. And so after World War II, it was split between uh, an, inf an area, North Korea, which was influenced by the Russians, and South Korea, which was influenced by the United States. And it was split along the 38th parallel. And I know this is a super small diagram. We'll go into more detail when we do detailed videos about the Korean War. But in 1950, you have the North Koreans invaded the South. So it started the Korean War. The US sent troops. The North Koreans had China on their side, the Chinese army. The Soviets were also supplying them. But at the end of the day, in 1953, you fast forward, it ends up being a little bit of a stalemate, because the end result was is that the original 38th parallel border gets, uh, I guess, reinstated. But that was the first real conflict of the Cold War. And notice, there were never US or Russian, or I shouldn't say Russian, US or Soviet troops directly firing at each other. The people who were, the US were firing, uh, were, were at war with the North Korean and the Chinese troops, but they were kind of proxies for the Soviet Union. And at the same time, as you can imagine, because you have these two adversaries, these two technically sophisticated adversaries, they both had they both had nuclear weapons. It became very interesting on who can kind of dominate space. So you have this kind of space race developing. In 1957, the Soviets uh, are able to are, are able to launch the first artificial satellite around the Earth. This is Sputnik 1 over here. 
Sputnik 1. Some people think the first Sputnik is the one that had the dog in it. No, that came a few months later. That was Sputnik 2. I actually had the picture of the dog here, but the, the dog eventually dies. But it was alive for a little bit in orbit. So that gets everyone freaked out. The US responds. Then in 1961, you have Yuri Gagarin. He's the first uh, person in space, first human being in space. He returns safely. We eventually get up there, or the United States eventually gets up there as well. And then you fast forward all the way to 1969, the US is the first to be on the moon. So you have this space race that's, you know, the two countries are really trying to uh, one up each other. And at the same time that that's happening, you have, and I bring this up just because so much happened during his presidency. In 1960, you have John F. Kennedy, you have John F. Kennedy being elected, kind of in the heart. The heart of the Cold War, and on, you know, the other interesting thing is he was the first Catholic president, which was, you know, people questioned whether, well, it, it that by itself was interesting, but was really interesting in his short presidency, and I, I think you might know that he only had, really, it, he actually became president in '61. This is an error. He was elected in '60, but he became president in '61. He had a very short presidency. Was assassinated in '63, but a lot happened in that short presidency. In 1957. Right before he became president, you had, oh, sorry, not 1957. Let me get my years right. 1959, you had the Cuban Revolution. Cuba became communist. Fidel Castro takes over. It becomes communist. So you can imagine the, the, the Americans didn't like a communist state so close to our own borders. So in, 19, in 1961, we support some ex-Cubans or some some uh, Cuban exiles to try to invade Cuba and there, that also can be a whole topic for another video in what you know there's debates between the CIA and the Kennedy administration of who was to blame for it being such a failure but it was a failure so it was a huge embarrassment to the United States and to, and and from the uh, the revolutionaries point of view I should you know the, the communist revolutionaries point of view they kind of viewed this as solidifying their hold of Cuba it showed that they could they could fend off a, a counter revolutionary counter revolutionary assault and then you have in 1962 we we have these spy planes and we see that the soviets are starting to put these ballistic missiles in cuba which really freaks the united states out because these ballistic missiles could reach any part of the united states we actually had similar ones in parts of europe and turkey but we didn't like these things here so we essentially use our navy to i would say blockade the, any more arms shipments to the Soviet Union. So Kennedy really has this kind of standoff with the Soviet Union during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. And most people believe that this was the closest that the United States and the Soviet Union ever got to actually having a war, and which would have probably turned into a nuclear war. But the standoff eventually got resolved. The, the Soviet Union agreed to remove their missiles. Well, one, not send any more missiles and dismantle the ones that they had already set up. And, and this wasn't publicly stated at the time, but the United States also agreed to do the same thing for our missiles that were pointed at the Soviet Union to remove those from Turkey. So the world kind of, at least you know, at that point in time, had avoided kind of a mutually assured destruction. The whole time that this is happening, remember, the United States is paranoid, and maybe justifiably so. Paranoia usually means worried when there's not a cause, but maybe justifiably worried about the spread of communism. You have a situation where in Vietnam, you have a Vietnam, which is right about, right about, let me make sure I get, no, let me circle the right country. You have in Vietnam, you have the communists come to power in North Vietnam. This was formerly a French colony. The US, right from the get-go in 1950, starts sending advisors to aid the, the anti-communists in South Vietnam. In Kennedy's administration, the amount of advisors, and I should probably put that in quotes, because these advisors started becoming much more involved, really grew. And until in 1965, the United States started sending its act actual you know, official combat troops to fight in Vietnam. And you fast forward that all the way to 1975. And the reason why this is significant, other than this being the one of the more recent major wars that the United States has been in, it's the first war that the United States kind of unambiguously lost. In 1975, the last, the last, uh, the last presence of the United States left. And essentially, Saigon, which was the capital of South Vietnam, fell 
to the communists. So I'll leave you there, and we're now essentially in modern history, you know, at least at least from my point of view, because I was born not too long after that. Anyway, hopefully you found that interesting. Let me. Oh, I couldn't find the stop button.